Okay, um, welcome everyone to uh, the latest um, Collections Trust live stream event. Um, I'm Sarah from Collections Trust. Um, I'm the Outreach Officer and I'll be hosting today's um, panel discussion on the topic of online collections. Um, so we're joined by a lovely panel who you can hopefully um, see, who are going to do some brief introductions shortly. Um, yeah, everyone give a little wave. <laughs> Great. Um, I just wanted to do a little bit of uh, an introduction and some sort of housekeeping for you all. Um, so as always, the video, yes, we're live streaming, but it will be saved and it will be up on our YouTube channel as we've done with the other previous panels. Um, and it will go up there with subtitles, which we will improve over the coming um, days because they're not always 100% accurate so we'll t check in with everyone and make sure that they uh, make sense so you'll be able to catch up with the event afterwards and fingers crossed as well we will also post a um, transcript um, of that as well so um, I'll be hosting I'll be monitoring keeping us on track and asking the questions I'm also going to be monitoring um, the Collections Trust Twitter account and I've put the um, Twitter handle in the YouTube description so if anyone's not sure it's at Collection Trust um, but you should be able to see it in the description there so you're welcome to join in the conversation if you have any um, additional thoughts or comments or even an additional question um, time permitting um, we're hoping to get through all the questions that you've submitted so thank you everyone who submitted a question if we do have time um, and anyone asks an additional one on Twitter we'll ask it but I think we've got a, quite a lot to talk about um, already um, as I say, we'll try and get through them all. So without further ado, I think that's everything from me. We will do some brief introductions from everyone and then we will dive into our questions. So we're going to do introductions in the uh, order that we're all appearing um, on the screen. So first of all, we'll hear from Rachel. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel Cartwright, Digital Engagement Officer for Southwest Museum Development and we're a sector support organisation working with museums in the Southwest who are accredited and working towards accreditation predominantly. Great, thanks Rachel. And then an intro from Anra. Hello everyone, um, I'm Anra Kennedy, I'm the Partnerships Director at Culture24. We're based in Brighton. We're also one of Arts Council England's sector support organisations um, and we work with museums and heritage sites across the UK to help them to do all sorts of digital skills related and collections related things. Great, thanks Andrea. And then we have Becky. Hello, I'm Becky Morris. I'm the director of the Disability Collaborative Network and also I'm an associate consultant for Embed. DCN supports museums of all sizes and budgets in relation to inclusive practice in service provision, the workforce and working practice and also in respect to digital. What we also do though is we work uh, with Embed to provide key learning in respect to what's happening across sectors and how this can support the heritage sector. Great, thanks Becky. And then we have Alec. Hi everyone, I'm Alec Ward, a Museum Development Officer for Digital and Communications with London Museum Development. And uh, we're also a sector support organisation uh, working with museums in London uh, who are either accredited or working towards accreditation. Great, thank you everyone. Um, so I'll start off by um, coming to all of you um, in order, but we're going to reverse the order that we've just um, done in the interest of being um, fair. Um, so we had two quite interesting questions that I'd like to, um, I'll read them out, but then I'm going to paraphrase um, and ask all of your thoughts on this. So we had um, a question saying, in the current circumstances, there might be a rush to digitise collections on a large scale basis, but do the panel think that this is the most effective approach to online collections? And what else should museums consider when planning an online strategy? And we also had an interesting question um, about uh, what we mean by getting collections online and online collections generally, because it's quite a broad term. There's all sorts of different things that that could encompass. So I'd like to hear from all of you what um, getting collections online means to you and how that might influence an organisation's strategy and things to consider. So um, we'll come to Alec first and then we'll go in the reverse order and hear all of your thoughts briefly on that. Thank you. Yeah, so that is uh, quite a question. I think, um, Sarah, you already sort of hinted at it, that um, collections online mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Um, so a lot of different things for a lot of different audiences and a lot of different things for a lot of different organisations. Um, I think when it comes to getting your collections online, you really want to be thinking strategically about it. Uh, museums have 
you know, a vast amount of content that you could potentially shove online. Um, but at the end of the day, not everybody wants to see everything. So the the more that you can know, you know, what your audience wants, the better. And then in hand with that, the more that you know what you want to achieve with what you're putting online, uh, the better. So making sure that the, the activities that you're doing are strategic in what your organization wants to achieve. Um, and then thinking about what's the best fit for your audience, but also the best fit for your collections. Um, I know that a lot of people are going to want to say um, quite a bit about this. So I'm going to pass on. I've, I always forget to unmute myself. There we go. Uh, if we could hear from uh, Becky next. Thanks, Alec. I think one of the key things for me is, is that if you rush content, it doesn't mean that necessarily it's going to be good quality. And the key thing as part of that is, is that any kind of um, digital offer is quintessentially your shop window in how you engage with inclusive practice. That's intersectional inclusive practice. So a person can be multiple identities. Um, but they may have forgotten to put their glasses on this morning. They may have a problem in respect to um, an eye condition. They may need captioning because there's wooden floors within their environment. The key thing is with that is that if you create a strategy that engages in, with inclusive practice, not only can you build upon your own existing knowledge and your organization, but also you increase your resources and your capacity by engaging in that time effectively. But also you can look at it from different angles in engaging with audiences and make sure that they're at the table when it comes to pre-planning, planning and then delivery. Lots of times you see specifics in relation to lenses. This is for people with X, this is for people with Y, when actually inclusion needs to be the whole experience. So what I would say is, is that look at strategy as an opportunity to look at what you've got, what you need, and also who you need to engage with. Great, thanks Becky. And Anra. Thanks, so building on what Alec and Becky have said, the thing that really interests me about collections online is that this is a key opportunity. It's a key way for your museum to interpret and engage and tell stories. And it's that storytelling side of it that I'm particularly interested in. And I think strategically, there's some, there's a real balance to be struck between responding to what your audiences are asking for and working with you. You really want to be doing that and, and presenting what you know um, and what you know about your collection and then balance, balancing that with everything that you and your audiences don't know about your collection um, and giving voice. This, this is an opportunity with online collection storytelling. It's an opportunity to bring in a multitude of voices and to tell stories that you might not be telling in your museum. And it's that side of it that fascinates me. And I think that's a, a really huge opportunity for the museum sector that we're only just getting to grips with now. Great, thanks Andrew. And Rachel? Agreeing with everything everybody's already said and to also build upon that, I think the idea that your online collection strategy needs to sit within a much wider digital engagement strategy for your organisation. So, and that's not something that you as an individual sitting today listening to this should have on your shoulders. This is an organisational, um, it needs to be a priority or they need to identify that this is an organisational priority for the development of the organisation and therefore that everybody sits at the table and discusses it to be able to put content online about your collections involves so many different members of your team, be it paid staff or your volunteers. And therefore you need to have that buy-in from everybody, but also the understanding of what you'll be doing in order to get that out there and how. The audiences side, I think we'll come on to it in another sec uh, question. So I won't go into it too much, but absolutely can't reiterate it enough that the audience engagement is crucial and what you might think as an as your initial thoughts of what you'd like to put out there might not actually be what the audiences engage with so it's about testing content as well seeing what engages well 
be a bit brave, be braver than you might normally be. In terms of your organization, make sure you've also got the sign off that you're, it's fine to be brave. Think about language in terms of accessibility, but also those different audiences that you're talking to. Um, and think about the different platforms and channels you're talking on. Everyone is different and everyone needs that tailoring. So it absolutely needs to be a strategy and something that not just one individual runs ahead with. Um, it needs to come from every, everyone. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, some really thought provoking um, ideas there. And I definitely picked up on Becky's point about quality over quantity. I think that's really important because if you think of putting on an exhibition, you wouldn't put everything in your collection on there, all of your uh, records on the walls. You wouldn't do that. But there's the temptation online to go, right, here's everything we have, you know, as bitty as it might be. Um, so I think um, that's a really good point around the sort of quality over quantity um, for sure. So um, in fact, leading on from uh, Rachel, you um, started to hint at this. So this is quite good timing. This is our next question. Um, and perhaps I could come to you first for this one. We had a question or a couple of questions about gathering feedback and using feedback to develop uh, what you're doing online. So I'd like to ask you, um, how do you know if something's working or if adjustments need to be made and any developments need to be made? Do you have any thoughts on that, Rachel? And then we can open it up. Yes, it's really crucial to be evaluating, as Sarah, you've just said, in terms of looking at it as if it was an exhibition in-house. You would also be evaluating how that works, the visitors, what their perceptions were. You'd be asking them the questions. That's the same with your activities online. Regard it as it's a, a tool for development. You're reviewing and changing as you go. Um, quality is really crucial, as we said before, but also thinking about what those audience might be wanting. So maybe there's some dialogue that you want to be having. There's so many ways to engage with audiences through commenting, through direct engagement through your newsletters um, online as well through your website I mean online as well obviously this is all online and thinking about how your audiences work it's not to assume it's to really look at that and to see what, what that engagement actually is and then make those iterative changes to the content that you're putting out so for example if you have some collections on your website through a blog or through some stories that you're telling or listing then you can use website analytics something like google analytics there's lots of support out there at the moment for that there's the tech champions james Zackers, who does a really great um session which is on youtube and you can find that audience agency do great work with this and there are individuals as well now um through Arts Marketing Association, Chris Unit's done some really good sessions that were for the digital boot camp. So loads of things out there, don't ignore it. It's such a fascinating wormhole you can go down, get access to your analytics on your website and see what your audiences are doing and who they are. Um, through that, you can have social media analytics, um, similarly looking at that, and third party analytics if you're on another site, then you can find mechanisms of working out if they're actually coming back to your site and and you are putting links through those third party sites and through that you might do something like a utm tagged link and there's lots of guidance for that as well and that's a whole other subject but i just want to throw it in there that through your analytics you can find so much out about your online audiences and then really respond to that and within the strategy as we've mentioned before i think do it as separate little projects. Think about the quality of the content. Think about the accessibility of it. Think about who you're talking to and then test it, review it. What were your goals? How do you measure the success? Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. Did any of the other panel have anything to um, add to that around um, sort of doing, doing some research, gathering feedback and then developing from there? Yeah, Alec, go for it. help if I unmuted myself. <laughs> uh, the, um, just sort of building on what uh, Rachel was uh, saying about using analytics to, to sort of work out what's working well and, and, and what isn't. I think that there's an opportunity for a lot of organisations to really focus on maybe two or three things that they could necessarily say are their, you know, topics, um, something that they know that they can do really well with their content. And be it because they have a specific, specific collection or they focus around a specific person. And I think um, analytics can really give you an idea as to what that topic may be um, by looking at what's working well and, and doing more of that sort of stuff. It can also help when it comes to like digitization projects, going back to that first question. 
um, the idea that you don't need to put everything up, but maybe you want to put up the things that you know you're best at and making sure that the content that you are putting up, as, as Becky was saying, is of good quality and, um, and is going to really serve your audiences. Um, and then, but I think sort of, you know, on the flip side of that is that you don't have to be sort of rigid with your focus and um, because obviously not all audiences are going to find the main things that you may be focusing on of interest. So thinking about how you can do, as sort of Rachel was saying, um, sort of side projects uh, where you might be sort of rethinking your um, the way that you're communicating those topics or even rethinking some of the topics that you are communicating to try and reach um, different and, and new audiences. Great, thanks. Um, anyone else keen to come in on that question? Yeah, Becky, go for it. Hi, yeah, um, just to add um, as well, um, there's your staff as well. So think about your staff um, in terms of how they're connected within the communities, but also empower them in respect to the projects. So, for example, I lead a neurodiversity adult group and they're great. And one of the things that they did was we did some work and they fed on back to our website at the, my, my museum where I used to work. They fed back on the website because that relationship was already established, but also it was a wonderful opportunity to see what they thought in respect to the, to the website. And it was great because literally I heard a, what are those elephants doing there? We knew, they didn't. So it's that kind of shifting that, angle and that lens so think about your staff they're one of the key assets in any organizations the collections are important but so are the people that are delivering the content so utilize and empower your staff to be part of the projects great thanks everyone Anra yeah go for it full house absolutely agree with everything the others have said I just wanted to throw in that sometimes managing expectations can be really hard around engagement and that's where working together with peers across the sector is so helpful because I come across expectations all the time that because someone a museum's put something online they expect the numbers to be huge and it can be really disheartening and I think we all need to be realistic and we need to value we need to value the engagement we get and understand that just because it's online, we might be getting really deep engagement with smaller numbers of people. But one of the simplest, easiest ways to manage expectations is to reach out to people at, at doing similar things to you and just share in a very light, light touch way. Just just share some of the scale that you're getting, share the numbers um, and manage everyone's expectations together. Great. Oh, Alec wants to come back in. Go on. <laughs> Sorry, just um, building on what uh, Amber and, and Becky were saying, and I think it's really important to remember that when you're looking at your analytics, you're only getting the information on the people who are looking at your things. So for the audiences that you aren't reaching, um, you're you're not reaching them for a reason, and you can't look at your analytics to try and you know necessarily work out why that might be. So as Amber was saying, you know, talking to um, colleagues in the sector. Um, when you see projects that they're doing that might be reaching the audiences that you're trying to reach yourself, asking them for advice or help thinking about other community groups that you can approach um, to, you know, talk to them about what they might want to see and the sorts of things that they might like. It's important, you know, analytics and social media and website analytics is really important and it is important to know, um, you know, what your audience is doing, but it's also important to remember that there's, you know, a huge chunk of people out there who you won't be seeing represented within those analytics. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks, Alec. Becky, I'm sorry, I'm just going to move on to the next question, but um, we maybe can come back to you in our final thoughts, if that's okay. I'm just keen to get through. We could talk about this for the whole hour, I think. <laughs> we probably could. Um, so uh, the next question, I'd like to come to Anna first, and I say, Becky, I'm sure we can come back to you um, for final thoughts on that at some point. Um, we had a question about some specific examples or case studies. Um, so can the panel provide some examples or case studies that community archive and heritage groups could use. So if we could come to you, Anra, for some thoughts on that. Okay, so I approach this question sort of thinking in terms of hints and tips if you were a community archival heritage group. And one of the things we do um, in our Let's Get Real program at Culture 24 is encourage people to learn from others, learn together and learn by doing. And 
following that, the, the learning from others, I think my first my first tip would be just to take some time to look around at what everyone else is doing. And that is so important to immerse yourself in in the behaviours and the storytelling and, and just getting familiar with, with other community archives and heritage um, projects. And there's a fantastic organisation called the Community Archives and Heritage Group. Um, and there are all sorts of examples on their website of fantastic projects. There's, um, oh, we had some, and they're just, there's, um, particularly they've got, they um, have an award. Um, and so one of the things, their award winners last year that really caught my eye, there's a site called Colourful Heritage, um, which tells the story of South Asian and Muslim heritage in Scotland. Um, and that's fantastic. So get familiar with things like that. Look at things like um, History Pin, which a lot of community archive and heritage groups use very successfully um, as a way of doing um, place-based storytelling around archives and heritage. We have a site called Museum Crush, which does a lot of storytelling around collections, and we're there um, to work with in partnership. So having a look at what other people are doing and looking um, particularly in social media channels as well. Um, the learning together, as we've just said in answer to the last question, it's so important to reach out to other people in the sector and work in partnership. There are so many organisations who are really willing to give their time and expertise here. So reaching out is, is so important. Um, and finally, that learning by doing, just getting out there and, and having a go. So local to me, one of my favourite community archive sites, it's, it's been going 20 years now, but my Brighton and Hove, and it started as a really small, very simple little um, simple website, a few web pages with a few community photographs, and it has built up. It's been relaunched several times. It's ebbed and flowed over the years. Um, but again, having a look at that and, and just getting going, whether it's on a social media channel, whether it's through a simple little website like that, um, that's, that's my... Yeah, that's where I would start. Great. Thanks, Sandra. And any of those um, examples that you mentioned, I'm sure we can um, add some links into the um, transcript as well. And I'm just going to take a... Minutes. Great. Thanks, Sandra. I'm just going to take a second to lock the room, which I forgot to do at the start, just in case we get a rogue, a rogue panellist. That was quite exciting. This conference has been locked by the host to prevent any more guests from joining. There we go. It's nothing like a live event, is there? So, um, so did anyone um, have any um, other thoughts or examples? I'm um, just following on from um, Anna's answer there around um, case studies or examples or any other just hints and tips. Um, should we come to um, Alex got his finger up and then Rachel? Yeah. Yeah, just a real quick um, uh, case study. Uh, I'm not sure if am I getting some feedback? We OK. Cool. Um, uh, a really nice example of a project, the, uh, the Nomad project. Um, uh, so they're, they're basically using uh, mixed reality and web-based technology. I'm reading off their website to make sure I get it correct. Um, website technology to contextualize archival Somali objects with the people and traditions to which they belong. Um, it's a LHLF supported um, project and I think it's run by Abira Hussein and um, it's just a really sort of excellent example of a sort of community-based project. Um, which is also using sort of collection objects um, and 3D digitization. I think it's already uh, cool and worth mentioning. Great. And Rachel, I think you put your hand up at some point. Did you as well? Yeah. Do you want to follow in? Um, not not as uh, as huge as that wonderful project that was at the museum's computer group, wasn't it, Alec? I remember hearing about that. It was wonderful. Um, and to add to that one as well, while we're just talking about those types of projects, the same organisation. Um, Nemes Nemesine, as they're called. They also have recently done a project um, called Sutton House Stories. And um, I really recommend that's with National Trust using mixed reality. I really recommend having a look at that well as well. Um, but for the museums that are, I work with in the Southwest, um, we're going to, we usually are looking at more kind of organizational development structure or infrastructure to allow us to get those collections online. And what Andra said, in, in a way that is will work for them and their capacity and their budgets. And 
place-based storytelling, really, really important. It goes back to what Alex said before as well about know what your subject is, know where you shine and what you are the experts in and that other people will really want to engage with and you're more likely to bring in those new audiences as well through that. Um, there are museum county groups that as museum development and South West Museum Development, we work with the different museum county groups and it's really great. Uh, they all completely vary, but they come together and share that practice as Anna was talking about. And I think there's so much to be built on there. So as an example, there's um, devonmuseums.net and that came out of some funding we did a, quite a while back, but to get everybody onto one place through making sure that they can connect, but also have a listings place. So when people come in and they want to know where, what museums in Devon, they have their own standalone website. And there's so much opportunity to build on that through collections and the working together, the sharing of practice, the ability to be able to ask each other for the boost, which Amra was talking about before as well, when you're putting things out there. So I think coming together in that way is crucial as the community groups and however that looks, who are your peers in that area, who are your national peers as well, who are the support organisations and just to give a nod to the subject specialist networks as well, um, really huge resources there and a wonderful place to kind of bounce ideas off and find out some really great information if you um, need to. Great. Thanks, Rachel. And before I forget as well, I can see Anna's got her hand up. I'll come to you. Um, I have also put in the description for the live feed um, a link to a new section of the Collections Trust website where we've got uh, a few different examples for many different types of presentation. So whether it's timelines, whether it's maps, whether it's games. So it's also worth, um, if you're just looking for some ideas or looking to see what tools people have used, I'd recommend having a look at that section, which is I've put in the um, description. It's on our homepage as well, if you go to collectionstrust.org. Um, um, and Anra, did you want to um, come back in on that question? Yeah, just a um, very quick thing, just talking about that working together and working in partnership again just to not forget that the, the the importance of a physical place to meet and that's one of the most fruitful things that museums and galleries and heritage sites can offer community groups and again using a Brighton example but Brighton Museum hosts coffee mornings um, for their local history group and that has been an incredibly fruitful way for them to help the group to understand the digital collection and for the group to then start telling stories and using the digital collection. So not forgetting the importance of those analog collections, those analog connections in terms of digital collections. Great. Thanks, Anra. Uh, yeah, Rachel, final thought on this question. It's a, a thought related to the archives. So I think that was part of the original question. And it was just an example that I wanted to throw in um, that's Know Your Place Bristol. And that was a National Lottery Heritage Fund project. And it's still going, I think it was a few years ago, but it's being maintained and it's being added to all the time. And it's map based, but through the archives, they're unpacking so many things. And it's those types of projects that need to be given the space to really grow and to be added to and to have that community engagement and um, it's fascinating. I know there are similar models around as well, but I just wanted to give that a bit of a plug, really. Nice. Thanks, Rachel. So um, the next question, I wanted to come to Becky, first of all. And then again, if we've got time, we can um, open it up for any thoughts. So we had a question um, about, oh, that's my very obnoxiously loud telephone. Two seconds. It's all kicking off here today. <laughs> so we had a question about um, accessibility uh, when it comes to online collections. So what are some of the key things to avoid, any of the pitfalls, or do you have any specific tips um, that are quite easy for museums to think about when it comes to accessibility online? So if we could come to Becky first of all, um, and then open that one up. Right. So um, if you are local government or central government funded, and that includes HLF projects as well, it is expected that you will reach WCAG 2.1 AA as part of the public sector bodies website and mobile applications number two, accessibility regulations 2018. And there is a time frame in relation to that. And that is absolutely critical. The second thing is, is that if you are engaging with any community groups, audiences, your non-users will be, as Alex was saying, 
this is about your non-users, your shop window. So if your shop window is not accessible, it is highly likely, in fact, I can guarantee it, that your audience, that audience will think your building is not accessible and they won't come. The other element to that as well is that there were some recent stats. That's what I was putting my hand up about, which I will find for you. But basically, we talk a lot about well-being within the sector, but there's about 13.9 million disabled people in the UK. But from the Joe Cox Foundation on loneliness, 53% um, of disabled people feel lonely. And 77% of young disabled people feel lonely. And 18% of learning disabled people feel alone. And the key thing is with that is that as a museum, if you're not putting in inclusion at the core of your organisation, in the end, particularly right now with the COVID pandemic and also in regards to the post lockdown society, there will be people who do not want to visit right now because they feel scared and I don't blame them. And I'm one of those people um, because I'm shielding. Now, the key thing is with that is that that's where you need to concentrate your digital offer and make it as inclusive as you can, because you have got a wonderful opportunity to challenge people's preconceptions of your organisation. But that doesn't mean tomorrow morning that you've got to rush out and just put something together and off you go. This is about actually thinking about how you're going to do it and also think about how what is already out there in terms of not only um, in terms of open source, in terms of low cost solutions, but also in terms of your time and also your capacity and building on your resources. But the most important thing of all is that this has got to be an ongoing process for which you need leadership buy-in. So you need to think about this, particularly if any legislation further changes, any future projects, you've got that leadership buy-in and that connection. So you're able to deliver these projects effectively so for me, in terms of the pitfalls and things to avoid is if you're not sure if something is inclusive, give us a shout. We can help you at DCN. We can also help you at Embed. In relation to this, that is not an issue. However, also ask your web developer, is it going to be inclusive? What are the level, what are the level which they will aim? Is it in your procurement document? that you will have inclusion within your digital project. That is absolutely critical. If you're at a, a conference and there is a situation where you think, that looks really cool, I wanna try that out, say to that developer, what's the, uh, what's the accessibility for it? Talk to me about the accessibility. And if they say, well, there isn't any, leave them alone. Don't, don't go there like that. Because in the end, this is about what we can do collectively as a sector to reach out to people who may not like us because they see the non-accessibility side of things, but also about how we can create strategy and build on our knowledge and our experience through our staff, through our communities, through our networks, to really develop something that's really special. Nine times out of 10, when I talk to people and support organizations, all of this stuff is very low cost. It's more about thinking differently and engaging. Yeah. And being able to look at something, particularly inclusion, is really exciting and innovative. And innovation, innovation doesn't mean Google Glasses. It can actually be a key idea. So this is the thing I'm talking about. Have some fun with it. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Becky. And I think um, that's a really good point about if you're working with especially a third party or even internally with another department, make sure that sort of stuff's embedded within the brief. I think that's a really, really good point. Um, so I'd like to now uh, come to... Alec, because we had a couple of um, questions that I think uh, you will have some thoughts on. Um, the first one being uh, short films. So the question was, we've been discussing making short films about objects or small groups of objects in our collection in-house, so doing it in-house. Do you have any tips, Alec? And then again, we can open that up if anyone else does. Yeah, so I think this uh, follows on quite nicely from um, what Becky was talking uh, about around accessibility and inclusion um, and video you know is probably one of the easier things to make inclusive through um, captioning but it's often something that that people 
don't do. Um, and I think, you know, it's important to say that inclusion and accessibility shouldn't be an afterthought. Um, you know, you should plan for it, you should make sure that um, you're doing it. And also, I think it's important to remember that by making something accessible for one group of people who may have access needs, um, you're making your content more accessible in general, not just for people with access needs, but for, for everyone. So um, I think uh, when it comes to making videos, um, you really want to be thinking about, well, so that you can look at it from two uh, perspectives. I can talk about the, the tech and the platforms and that sort of stuff. But, you know, the first um, thing that you want to be thinking about, and I'm sure uh, Rachel Amber and uh, Becky would agree, is, you know, why are you doing this? Who are you doing it for? What's the audience that you're looking at? Um, have you done this sort of stuff before? Has it been received well by your audience? Um, is it something that you're trying to experiment with that you, that you might not have done? Um, so again, looking at your analytics and your social media analytics, um, talking to you know, other organizations that might make videos to, to get some ideas and inspiration, I think is all really important. Um, that should be your first port of call once you've you know, done that work, once you've thought about that, and once you have a clear idea of um, how this sort of content might feed into a wider strategy, if you have a social media strategy, um, it doesn't need to be a you know, piece of paper, but you know, have a think about the goals and what you want to achieve uh, through the platforms. Once you've done all that work, you can then start thinking about um, you know, the equipment that you're gonna need, the platforms that you wanna be using. So um, the one thing that I would say is when it comes to equipment, in general, you pay for what you get. Um, so if you go cheap, um, usually the content isn't gonna be as good quality. I'm not saying that you need to spend you know, thousands and thousands of pounds on a 8K Sony you know, camera or whatever. Um, so think about your budget and how you can stretch your budget, but um, you can make good content with uh, mobile phones and, and apps, um, but in general, the quality of the, the content will be better if you spend a little bit more and you use um, more expensive equipment. Um, I think when it comes to videos, sound is incredibly important. Um, people in general will forgive poorer quality video um, for better quality sound, but if, uh, if the sound on a video is really poor, um, then people will switch off straight away. And again, you want to be thinking about the accessibility of it um, because, uh, you know, poor sound makes it really difficult for, for people to actually hear what's going on. Um, the Another thing that you might want to think about is lighting. So if you're doing videoing within uh, the organization, uh, within the museum, sorry, if you like uh, videoing collections in the storage or videoing collections uh, within a gallery setting, um, quite often they're not lit very well because obviously you know light damages objects. Um, but when you're making the videos, you might want to think about purchasing some cheap lighting, um, just so that you can light them a bit better. And again, that will really improve um, the quality of your video. And then when it comes to editing, you want to be thinking about um, thinking about your skills and your abilities, the amount of time that you have to put into it. Um, so if you want something really quick and really easy, you can use mobile apps. Um, if you've got an iPhone, the iMovie mobile app isn't too bad. Um, but Filmora Go is a good alternative on Android and on um, iPhone. And then if you're thinking about editing something a little bit larger scale, maybe something longer or you know, doing some more um, technical things with the video, uh, then I usually recommend HitFilm, um, HitFilm Express. Um, and that's a free online video editor um, which you download as a program. Um, and that works on um, all uh, processor, uh, bleh, bleh, computer programs, what am I saying? Windows, Mac, Linux, um, it, it works across the board. Um, so so yeah, that would be my <laughs> quick, there's, there's a lot. And um, one thing I will say is uh, for London Museums, um, we're running a training session on video editing um, in, at the end of this month, 22nd or 24th of July. Um, but we record those sessions and we'll put them online on our YouTube channel. Um, so uh, for organizations outside of London, um, because we are funded to support London museums, um, you can check out the video and uh, hopefully that will help with video editing. Awesome. Great. Becky, yeah, hand straight up. Go for it. Yeah, just a, a quick to add to that. That was great. Oh, it was brilliant. Um, just two things. Um, first of all, think about the speed in which you speak and also the tone. There is some great stuff on YouTube about how actors 
sort of elaborate on certain words that creates content that's really engaging and interesting. Um, and that's on DCN's website, which I can send you the link to. And also there is um, some social media tools that we've picked up as well along the way and, uh, and happy to support people with their social media. But yeah, that was great. Great. Well, I've definitely learned a lesson not to speak too fast, which is what I do, and not to have an obnoxiously loud telephone going off in the back, speaking of sound. So great. Thanks both. Um, Anra, I can see you uh, gesturing. Did you want to come in on that one? I just uh, wanted to throw in a few examples um, because video is such a powerful tool. And um, just one that I was tipped off to, a really recent example by my colleague Rosie Clark, York Museums. Um, we were talking earlier about community heritage and about bringing diverse voices into your collection storytelling. And there is just a magical video at the moment. They're doing a project celebrating gypsy and traveler heritage um, in the area. And there's a video of a young boy showing you around his great grandfather's caravan. Um, and that's just a lovely one. You can share the link to that. Then there's some really simple use of video on another fantastic community um, heritage archive, the Armedic Valula and Manchester based group and they've been putting um, oral histories together with just really, really simply with collection um, images and there's some really fabulous stories coming out of there. And then just to give a shout out as well, well, firstly for the Museum From Home, have a look at the Museum From Home hashtag on Twitter because there's all sorts of great um, video there. Dan Bo, the wonderful Dan, is doing great stuff um, himself with video on there. Um, and finally, Michael. Hardy, another shout out, Barnsley Museums. He's been doing some really playful, fun, non-video is their museum jigsaws. It's been really, really great. But he's been doing a museum Jenga and museum bingo, just really playful, but collections based, always coming back to the collections and very simple and just having a go. It's not high production values, but they're, they're great. Great. Thanks, Anra. Um, so we had a, another question um, around uh, programs and apps that um, Alec might want to come in on. Um, and then I think I saw Rachel's hand up. So if we've got time, we'll come back to you as well. Um, I'd be interested in any programs or apps we're unaware of um, that work well for new ways of presenting collections. Now, that's a very big question, but are there any that, mm. come, that come to mind specifically, Alec? Um, unaware of... Uh... Yeah, we don't know what they are aware of, so I guess that's yeah. a difficult question. I'm, assuming, I'm going to assume that they're not aware of any, and then I'll just uh, sort of list off a few. I think, again, um, you know, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but you want to be thinking about your audiences, about your content. You want to be thinking about um, you know, your strategy for uh, audience engagement, if you have one, or at the very least, what your museum wants to be achieving with the things that you're doing. Um, so, you know, start from that as the top and then work your way down. Um, but there's, you know, loads of interesting um, platforms, apps, programs out there for doing really interesting things. So, like, if you're thinking about 3D digitization, for instance, um, you can host them on a pla uh, platform like Sketchfab, um, which there's lots of great examples, like the British Museum, for instance. Um, they do a lot of uh, 3D. And um, the process of photogrammetry, it sounds um, intensive and scary, uh, but to be honest, it's not that hard um, and it's not too expensive either if you have a decent digital camera um, you can you know make potentially a 3d model of your um, museum collections there are apps out there as well that you can do it through um, but in general you need a more powerful um, sort of like a newer iphone for instance um, you'll be able to use some of the newer apps to make better 3d models of your collections and then yeah host them on a platform like sketchfab but then you can use the embed a uh, link to embed it on your website and that sort of stuff if that's something that you fancy doing. Um, I think, I'm sure Amra is going to talk about it, but I think Museum Crush is a really great platform for um, sharing your collections, not just because um, I think it gives you an opportunity to do more than just sort of like put your stuff up there and, and let people have a look at it. Um, it's more about sort of like weaving and telling really interesting stories um, around your collections. And I think that's usually where you get the most powerful content when you have like a really good story behind it. Um, and I know that they've done a lot of work on that platform to, to make it um, as good as it is. So I'm sure Amra will want to have a quick chat about that. Um, if you're thinking about like stop motion animation, you can animate your collections using stop motion. So there's like stop motion app, um, which works on iOS, so uh, 
iPhone and it works on Android. Hitfilm Express for video editing, I already mentioned that. I also realize I'm speaking really quickly, so I'm gonna slow down. Um, if you're thinking about editing images um, online, Pixlr, P-I-X-L-R, is a really good online image editing platform. And if you're thinking about doing something more um, technical, then you can download a program called GIMP, um, unfortunately named, but still pretty good as a um, free alternative to um, Photoshop. So if you're thinking about doing some really creative stuff with your uh, collection images, then um, check that out. If you're thinking about creating GIFs, then you could use Giphy, G-I-P-H-Y. Um, if you're thinking about creating like timelines, Adobe Spark, um, but there are also plenty of free alternatives as well. Um, and two things that we're going to be doing um, upcoming training sessions, uh, we teach people to use a platform called Twine, uh, which is like it lets you create one of those like choose your own adventure games and um, which you can host online and you can use images of collections in that. And then uh, we also teach people how to make really basic uh, museum interactives using PowerPoint. And again, you can turn those into videos. And so there's, there's all sorts that you can do. Um, I think, you know, think about what you want to achieve. Think about your strategy, about your content and what's going to work best. Um, but also check out uh, the Collections Trust webpage. Um, I think you've got a link, Sarah, because uh, there's some really great examples of how you can display collections online in, in interesting and unique ways. And then there's, you know, examples of museums doing that. So I think that's great. that's me. Thanks, Alec. And I know Rachel had a hand up uh, at some point. Rachel, was there something you wanted to come call back on or um, respond to? I can follow up on what Alex said. What I um, I wanted to, it was following from the other question, I wanted to give a few extra things about um, top tips to accessibility when Alex was talking about videos, but that can come later if we have time. If I just pick up on the thread now, um, talking about kind of third party platforms or other apps that we might not be aware of, um, not knowing what that might be, but I just wanted to say above that, that putting your own content out on your own website, so your own social media is one level of engaging. You need to know, and um, I think we're coming around for top tips at the end, and this is mine, but we need to know that you have the rights to do that with your collections. It's so crucial, and often it's something that might get missed, and is a non-negotiable. You need to know that you have the rights to be able to put that online. When you're working with a third party, it becomes even more important it's really important anyway but you'll be signing agreements with them whether it's more of a formal contract or it's just something that you tick as you go through with that partnership or project agreement whatever it is and you need to know that you have the rights to do that so as well as thinking about your strategy what are the core elements of your collection that you want to be putting on to something that's third party you will have the opportunity to reach new audiences but how they experience that and the risk that you take are present. So I wanted to highlight that first and then talk about a project that I've been working on and give a, a shout out. Um, so I, we're based, Southwest Museum Development is based within Bristol Culture. We're hosted by them and I sit within Bristol Museum and we're really lucky. I sit with a digital team one day a week and we have a um, Digital Futures or the, one of the British Museum um, traineeships, Roisin Daly. So hi, Roisin, if you're watching. And Roisin and I are working really specifically on a project at the moment with Google Arts and Culture. And we're going through the process of getting those works online. But the process is the journey that we're taking at the moment. We are not yet ready to press publish. And I just want to mention that the steps that you take within the team, so it's a team effort to get those things together, to double check the rights, to check that the images that you have are the right quality, because for your own website or social, it's one thing, but for a third party site, it might be a lot more. Um, and we're going through that at the moment. And it's a great journey, but one that's taking a lot of learning. And um, and I think it just needs to be considered within that, that yes, the opportunity is there. I'd, I'd say test it out on something that's free first. So something like Google Arts and Culture, you're not paying at the point of entry to have anything on there. So for a small amount of your collection to put it up on there, it goes through a huge process of getting the data, sorting out, matching the images, checking, but it shows you the efforts that you need to do to start thinking about your getting your collections online in that type of search functionality. If you've not um, discovered Google Arts and Culture, I do recommend having a look at the different functionalities that they have because it's, it's really, really fascinating, all the things you can do. And the other thing which I discovered, but Roisin also pointed out to me 
earlier today was the Smartify app, which I've not fully explored, but it was on my radar as well. And they've said that they're doing audio tours for free for, for 2020 now. So just wanted to say there are things at the moment that are options to explore for free, especially thinking about smaller museums, volunteer led ones. Don't launch into a hugely funded project at the start because the journey is massive. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. I can see Anra wanted to come in on that briefly. And then we've got our final wrap up question um, after that. Thanks, Anra. Very briefly, um, we can't ignore Wikipedia as another fantastic platform. And they have, of course, enormous audiences. And uh, Wikimedia UK, again, we can share the link, but they, they work a lot with the cultural sector. Um, you can run editathons like Ditchling uh, Museum of Arts and Crafts near us, did a very successful one putting telling the stories of um, women crafters and artists. Uh, it's a fantastic platform and lots of potential, as Rachel said, for doing things um, without huge cost, though, of course, there is always a cost in time and effort. That's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thanks, Anra. So um, I've got one final um, question that I'd like, again, to do a bit of a, a sort of round um, table from all of you. Um, and it's a question that I wanted to ask because we noticed uh, when the questions came through, there were some amazing questions. So thanks again to everyone who submitted. But there were some questions that we thought, oh, we were expecting some questions on this or that. Maybe it's because they just haven't they've been overlooked or people don't realise that they need to know this stuff. So um, I thought I'd ask you all um, to wrap up. In your opinion, what one thing do you think people often overlook or forget about in relation to um, what we've just been talking about? So if I could start with uh, Rachel and then we'll go in order. Yes, I mentioned it just now, rights management. It's absolutely huge. And if you have an acquisition and you have the paperwork and you know that this is your in your collections, it's been catalogued, you've digitised it, that does not necessarily mean that you have the rights to put it online anywhere. So you need to check that whether it's in your paperwork and documentation is crucial. So Collections Trust have so much information on this on their website. And Sarah obviously does a lot of outreach sessions related to this. But it's crucial to know that and do not assume. So just because you have it in your collection, that doesn't mean that it's out of copyright or that you can use it. So you, you're kind of looking at four things. Is it out of copyright? Um, so do you hold the copyright for it? So that's the major question. Um, what's the material that you don't have the copyright for? Put it to one side and just leave it. If we're talking about digitizing and getting online, just put it to the side for a while, unless it's a crucial, crucial thing and you know the author or the artist or whoever it is, and you can contact them to ask permission and get a license for that. And the material that you hold, you do not hold the copyright for and you do not know who it belongs to, that's a whole other project where you get some great people in or within your team, you isolate a lot of time to go on a massive research project, which is really fun, but maybe not the priority um, for the organisation. Great. Thanks, Rachel. So shout out to the Spectrum Rights Management Procedure there. Great. Thank you. Um, so, Anra, what do you think people often overlook or forget about? I think people um, maybe not overlook, but underestimate the amount of time and the amount of skills. There are so many multi-layered skills and digital literacies involved in putting collections online and then going through that whole process through to meaningful engagement. And we've talked about so much of it, whether it's the accessibility side, the storytelling techniques. And I think we need to understand that we need as a sector, we need to support each other and we need to learn those skills and share those skills. And we also need to value those skills because people in the sector over the last few years have built up this huge skills bank. Um, and I think our museum leaders, when these projects begin happening, need to understand how much time and effort, how much skill is involved and also to value those skills in their teams and their volunteers. Awesome, thanks, Andrew and Becky. Right, okay, so I'm going to say inclusion um, because I often find within my own work that inclusion is something that needs to be adopted at the core of, of all of our services and particularly now with the changing needs of our audiences but also the changing needs of our workforce. And the key thing is with that, with any kind of digital collections project, I keep thinking about what Matt Fraser said 
in respect to understanding disabled and neurodivergent narratives in that people need to feel able to contribute on an equal collaborative partnership with the museum. We're not inviting them, we're not gatekeepers. We're about actually an equal collaborative role. And the key thing is with that is that there's some really good stuff going on right now. The problem is, is that often that is overshadowed and we need to celebrate the good stuff as well as the stuff that we need to work on. But most importantly, I do feel that we need to also think about our workforce, that as we get older, our needs change. So we're DCN and Embed are working together in supporting the sector on what digital tools can be available to support our workforce, but also how they align to things like access to work. And that includes collections and curators, because I'm a, a former collections person myself. But most importantly for me, it's actually about saying, you know, that's not right. And being able to say, I can show you how to put it right, like that, or talk to my friends, talk to this charity, mm -hmm. talk to this organisation and get it, get it right, like that. Because often what I find is, is that often within inclusion, it's something that, yeah, we'll, we'll add it on, like Alex said, but the problem is with adding, adding it on, it takes more time and it takes more money. So have it in right at the start. So that is the key thing. That's it. Core intersectional inclusion in everything we do, including our output and our digital projects. Awesome. Thanks, Becky. And finally, Alec. Alec, you are muted. <laughs> So close, almost completed the whole thing without. Uh, oh well. Um, so so yeah, I was, I was just saying that there's a the majority of things that I was going to say um, have been covered. Um, I think I was kind of interested that there was a, a huge amount of mention, and maybe it's already been covered by um, other panels. But talking about uh, collection care when doing the digitization, um, thinking about you know making sure that the collections are properly cared for. Um, when when you are doing that digitization. And I think um, that sort of comes back to what Amory was saying about the skills um, related to the project is um, making sure that your staff are you know, fully trained um, in relevant collection care, but also in the actual process of digitization. And then I think the last thing um, is why, you know, why are you doing this digitization? Um, it can be really tempting to see lots of really exciting and interesting projects that other people are doing and think to yourself, this is what we want to do. Um, but you should always start with the why before you get to the, the what. Um, so, so I think that would be my final um, tip there. Uh, top tip would just be to make sure you know why you're doing the things before you do them. Great. That's a really good point. A good one to um, finish on as well. Uh, why Why in the first place? And um, We also had a really nice um, comment from uh, somebody on Twitter who said that their one top takeaway from this is that online collections work is not individual, but organisational. So everyone should be involved in consultation, planning and delivery. And I think that was in response um, to what you were saying, um, Becky, about the individuals being, um, the people being just as important about the as the objects and the content. So I thought that was a nice um comment on Twitter. I didn't see any questions, which is good because we, we are two minutes to 12. Um, so I don't think we would have had time anyway, but some really nice um, comments and engagement on Twitter. So I just wanted to fi uh, finally just say thank you so much again to our lovely panel for answering all the questions really well and uh, bang on time. So thank you. And as I said, thank you everyone who submitted a question as well. I hope you feel like we um, did them justice, even though I slightly rejigged some of them. Hopefully you recognised um, your questions in there. And I also wanted to flag up, um, keep an eye on our website, which hopefully you should be seeing um, now. It's uh, collectionstrust.org.uk. And that's also our um, events contact email address. So um, keep an eye out for any other future events that we're doing. It might be training events. It might be online coffee mornings. But also we are doing another panel Q&A on the 1st of July at the same time. So 11 till 12, it's a Wednesday, I believe. And that's gonna be about loans in lockdown. So um, that's gonna be a really um, interesting um, session as well. So um, I think the questions for that um, submission closes at the end of the day. So if anyone has any um, burning uh, lockdown loans questions, um, do submit them in the next um, few hours. 
Um, and I think that's everything from me, apart from a reminder that the uh, video will go up, subtitled, all of that sort of stuff. And maybe just a little final wave for everyone before we um, stop streaming. Thank you, everyone, so much. Bye.